Good morning. Microphone, I know, it's part of the show. I mean, give me a break. I haven't even started and he's heckling me. My God. I'll start again. Hello. Good morning. Dobri utra. Brasvici. Buongiorno. Bonjour. Privet. Shove my mic. Oh my God. <laughs> Take it with me. What a good idea. Stand by for the Rolling Stones here. It's necessary for interpreting, you know, for interpreting microphone. Second, it's necessary for for interpreting and for video recording. Is the interpreter okay? Can you hear me back at the back there? Yes, she's nodding. I've just said um, good morning, probably seven times. So you're probably thinking, what a complete idiot this guy is. The interpreter is probably saying, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do with this guy? There's one, there's one real benefit with being considered an idiot, especially when you smile like I do. It makes it even worse. You think, oh, this, he's definitely an idiot. He's smiling all the time. I'm open to suggestions here. It's, uh, I'm trying to wake you up. No suggestions about why it's being good to be an idiot? Say again? People remember you. People remember you. Oh, that's very good. Very good. Give that man a banana. Say again? You can get, yeah, exactly. Now we're starting to warm up now. As, as more people come in, the main reason why it's handy to be an idiot, this is part of my marketing strategy, idiot, idiot 101, um, is you can ask a question, a dumb question. What is it about children? They ask, they ask dumb questions. Well, they're not dumb questions, are they? They're quite insightful questions. You know, they say, Daddy, Daddy. Why does the sun rise? Holy crap. <laughs> there's that. Uh, hang on a sec. Well, you see, there's this sun thing up in the sky, which is basically driven by fusion, and all the planets are orbiting around it. And you go, oh, no. It, it just, it's that way, sun. It just happens every day. And then you, get, you do get worse questions about when it, you know, why, why is daddy kissing the nanny, etc., which is a more difficult one to answer. But the thing is, there is a beautiful innocence in that question, why? So as I go through this, it's my, my theme is not idiot, idiocy or being an idiot, it's, it's asking why. And it's always good, particularly in our industry, like any others, to ask why. Now, the global marketing landscape, which is essentially what I'm here to talk about, I'm trying to position myself as what the client might say to you. Uh, we focus on marketing and advertising, so we're operating in a continuum which is called the global market. Now, unless any of you have been living in Kamchatka, anyone from Kamchatka here? If there is, I really appreciate you coming all this way to listen to an idiot speak. But if you haven't been living in Kamchatka, or somewhere equivalently remote, you will have noticed that things have changed. The global marketing landscape has changed, the, the global landscape has changed, the rules have changed. So that means that big brands like Nike, etc., emerging brands like, and ambitious brands like Dyson, and LSPs like Intex and Megatex, etc., we all have to respond. If we want to be positioned in this marketplace, we have to respond to the global market environment. We're not sit we might think we're sitting in a crazy, wonderful, protected little world called translation, but we know we're not. So I can't really give you the full lowdown on the global market plus the forecast for the economy for the next five years. So uh, I'm limited in time, and you're probably limited in endurance as well. <laughs> After all, there's only so long you can listen to an idiot speak, isn't it? I'm going to talk about four things. I think, it was, I think it was Bill Clinton. Some of you may remember a chap called Bill Clinton. Uh, he, hopefully for the right reason, not for the red dress reason. Um, Bill Clinton had, a, had, a, had a, an election slogan which said, it's all about the economy, stupid. When I was a, a young chappy, my sales manager had an even more opposite way of saying it. He said, follow the money, dummy. Now, that is a very simple point, but if I come on to 
our friends on the left here. To put it succinctly, Europe is in the merd, the scheiss, up the creek. I'm hoping... Makes sense? Yeah, just making sure. <laughs> is anyone actually on the train? Yes, we've got a couple of people getting translated. Because uh, this probably sounds like rubbish at times. Europe is pretty much screwed. Uh, the recession started in about 2008, and there's pretty much no light at the end of the tunnel, I'm afraid. America, I have to say, uh, their budget deficit is now declining, uh, but their credit cards are pretty much still maxed out. So the only places where the money is are in the eponymous, eponymous, I'll try and say it, I struggle with that word myself, I don't speak Greek. Um, you know them as the BRICS, okay? But to the BRICS, I would also add Singapore, Indonesia, Turkey, and of course, all the oil-rich states. That's where you have a burgeoning middle class. That's where you have growing economies. That's essentially where the money is. Just to give, throw a few statistics at you, China now has seven and a half thousand billionaires. RMB billionaires, but divide by 10 and you get pounds, and divide by 7.5 and, and you get euros. There's an awful lot of billionaires in China. China is also forecast to be the world's biggest e-commerce market by 2015, two years from now. That gives you an idea of the size of the money. Also, as you probably are well aware, Russians seem to own most of central London, um, big chunks of the Côte d'Azur, as I found out, half of Florida, and bits of Tuscany. So that's where, that's where the money is. So any brand, any emerging brand or global brand, they have to follow the money. They have to go for these markets. So they see the market opportunity in my extended version of the BRICS. That's where their attention is focusing. Now, to do that, they have to understand the market conditions. They have to tailor their marketing strategy to those different countries. And they are all very different countries. They have different rules and regulations. They have different conditions. Notice I have not mentioned language. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a given. But they need to understand all these other things. They need to adapt their strategy. Moving on to my next point. Who can deny the impact of the digital mobile explosion? I mean, all, people are sitting here with tablets, smartphones, etc. It is a self-evident fact. That has really changed the way people behave online, the way they consume things, the way they watch the news, or they gather the news, they get information. Everything's changed, and that has a major impact on how people market and will want to market. And also, if you start thinking about my why, what happens down the line to where we are. And finally, my final kind of point, which is this horrible globey thing in the corner, it's the ubiquitous social media. Social media now is, is a dominant part of any marketing strategy. In 2012, according to, to Comscore, of the 46 million online users in Brazil, a staggering 97%, 97% of online users in Brazil use social media. That's where they're at. They're probably not watching television. As you probably know, uh, vContact at 100 million active users is actually the biggest social media platform in Europe. In Europe, it has more users than Facebook. Another interesting point is, in terms of e-commerce, Brazil, uh, Amazon launched kin the Kindle store in Brazil, on the online bookstore in Brazil in 2012 successfully. Guess where they're going next? Surprise, surprise. According to Forbes magazine, they're going to Russia. So this is the digital world, this is the, the global landscape that they're operating in and, in case you hadn't guessed, that we're operating. This is the world we inhabit. We look at it through our translation, localization, LSP glasses, 
but this is the world as they see it. <laughs> after, that, after that summary, you're probably asking, what the hell does this all mean? Well, in this, in this world I've just described, it's difficult, is it not, to see a huge increasing demand for the old-fashioned, simple document translation. It's, just, it's probably not going to happen, and you, and you know this. So I'm going to make, a ra as I want to, a rather sweeping and, and maybe outrageous statement. But from the client's perspective, right, this whole high throughput volume translation challenge, right, from the client's perspective, it's cracked, it's done, it's sorted, it's finished. Right, with, work, with modern workflow technology, with TMs, with machine translation, post-edit, and translators in the cloud, as far as the clients are concerned, it's done. It's a non-discussion. They don't care about the process. They know the bits are there. They've got technology vendors telling them it's, it's easy to set up, etc. We go, no, no, it's not quite as straightforward as that. But in reality, that's their perception. That's the way it is. So, in some respects, let's stop talking about translation outside of these conferences. It's done. It's fixed. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there's going to be not going to be improvements. There's technology vendors making better TM systems, better workflow systems, better MT systems, better clouds to bring more people on, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, there's going to be more LSPs picking up on this technology. I watched one of the presentations yesterday. So that it, not everyone is using it, but as far as the client's concerned, that's it. The highway's there. Stop talking about building the highway. Now, we all know, again, from Hans mentioned it in his keynote, we had it in the panel yesterday, the effect of this is the drive to the bottom. Commoditization. It's an inescapable fact. I won't say any more. The street price of translation, because of this, will continue to dive. Right? That's effectively the cost per word. It's not necessarily what you get paid, but as far as the client's concerned. Which brings me to another hypothesis or postulation. It's very early in the morning for one, but never mind. <laughs> at what point in this, right? at what point do we reach where TP, translation proofreading, is worth Nothing. At what point, how far away is it before it's free? Before we bundle it? Right? You, you ex exponentiate, extend what, what we've got now, and at some point, with MT and everything else, the baseline translation is going to be free. You're not going to be paying for the words. You might be paying to use the technology, but you may not be paying for the words because it's not really touched by a human hand. How far away is that? So, you know, I'm not putting any dates on it, but you can draw the line for yourself. It's only going one way. But so then let's step back from that. So let's ask ourselves another why type question. If what I say is true and the, and the cost of translation is insignificant, slightly irrelevant, I mean, if you've got a couple of million words, it does tend to add up. I agree. But generally speaking, Certainly from a marketing perspective, a thousand words is a lot of words. Ten thousand words is a bloody lot of words. It doesn't tend to come through that way. But let's park that. Let's step back, right? Ask yourselves, is the cost of translation the major impediment to a brand, a new brand, going into a new market? Say that again, somebody? No. No. I don't think so. And I'll talk about why I don't think so. So, based on my argument, right, in many respects, the translation is the cheapest and easiest part of going global. We've just established it's cheap. We've just established we've got the workflow systems. So what is it? So what is it the clients need when they're going into a new market? Well, first of all, this is kind of marketing 101, but the first of all, they need to understand what's the target audience? If I'm going to market into the Ukraine or into Russia, what's my target audience? Where are they? 
you know, we, we discussed there's the Eastern Ukraine and there's a Western Ukraine. There's a language thing, but there's a cultural thing. There may be differences in, demo there will be differences in demographics, etc. So first of all, they need to understand who, who is, is their target audience and then how do they reach them? How do they create awareness? If you're a new brand, you know, if you're Nike, it's, it's easy. Right? If you're Nike, you're, you've already done all that. But if you're a new brand trying to expand out from, from a, and there's a company called iClogs in Britain you've never heard of. Why would you have heard of them? But they're going global. So they need to create awareness for, the, for their brand in the market. They need to understand the local buying habits and the behavior, how we, how we buy things, how we like to buy things. Then they need, when, once, they've, once they've understood that, then they need to target the audience and generate some demand. Ooh, I want a new pair of trainers. Ooh, I want that game. Ooh, I want that car. They've got to create demand for it. They've got to create demand for offer for their product. And then once they demand, guess what? They've got to engage with the client, the consumer. They've got to build trust. You know, if I walk up to you and say I can sell you a BMW or a Ferrari, you know, because I know you're all in the translation business, you're all loaded, you're all rich, I know that. I well, you know that's, that's one of my first major lies, but you knew that. But if I come up to you and say, I've got a BMW, give me, give me 10,000 euros and the keys are yours, you're going to go, whoa, there's a trust issue. You've got to build trust. And a new market a brand has to build trust. How do they build trust? They need, in this day and age, they need referrals on social media. They need testimonials. They need to know someone else has already dealt with you and you're okay. So... If that's what they need to enter the market, right, they're going to need help. What are they going to need help with? Well, clearly, they're going to need help with that you need, you need to have market surveys. You need to have market research. I think some, I, I, some, someone's, I've seen someone mention this already in their, in their presentation. You need to understand that market. To understand these sorts of things, you need to do research. That means surveys to get this data. You don't just launch into a market. You need hard data. They're also, they really need to develop branding and style guidelines, which should kind of ring bells with, with you guys, right? But they need to do that so that before they enter a market, they understand the culture, they know how to position themselves. It's a, branding and style guidelines for a market are not actually about translation. They're great for us because they give us a brief, but it's about what's my tone of voice? How do I want to be perceived? You know, am I wearing a business suit or am I wearing jeans and trainers? You know, am I 14 or am I 48? You know, do I drive a BMW or a Lada? You know, it, it's all those sorts of things which are incredibly important about how you position your brand if you want your brand to exist and, and, and last. Which brings me on to um, things like transcreation. I snapped this um, in Kiev in February. I'm sure you're all well aware of the brand. I'm led to believe it's actually in Ukrainian, but I'm willing to be contradicted. Um, and you can see that the, the, the trans, you know, the transcreated, I've back translated it. It's not quite the way it's run in Europe, but it works, and I think it's cunning. But that's a good example of transcreation. Now, you might be saying, well, that's, that's translation. Well, yeah, it, it, it is, and it isn't. More about that later. But the difference is, this needs to be done way, 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 way back before you start thinking about entering the market, right? This needs to be ready to go out for if you're buying media space like these outdoor posters, etc. This needs to be ready very early on. And it needs to be tested. If you're doing this in multiple countries, you don't just say, oh, that's a great tagline, get it translated and send it out. <laughs> I know, I know clients who have done that. <laughs> and the word idiot starts to come back into play again. But that's not the way you do it. If you're going to be successful, if you're Nike, or Apple, and they all make mistakes. You have to do this sort of stuff to understand first. So, so transcreation may take place six months or a year before you enter the market. And finally, there's obviously, well not finally, but there is obviously paid and organic search. Most of you will understand if you want to get on page one, you need to do search engine optimization in Yandex and Google. That takes time, typically three to six months to get any sort of ranking in a new market where nobody knows you. The only way to leapfrog that and get traction, which is what you need when you launch in a market, is paid search, because that gets, allows you to get onto page one. Now clearly, 
I, mean, I don't have to really write this large, but Yandex is very different from Google. It's very Russian language specific. The search algorithms are different, right? The, the, the way they, they, are, uh, they review websites, they use lots more humans, and they're Russian, they speak Russian, and you can talk to them. That clearly gives you an advantage if you speak Russian. And you are a Russian, or you're a part of the Russian culture. Ditto social media. Social media is very culturally dependent and culturally specific. You know, we've mentioned vContact. I know there's other social media. But the way you guys use social media is not necessarily how someone in the UK or America. I mean, I notice, as, sorry, I notice the differences myself when I'm reading the tweets on how people are doing things. And that's exactly what you'd expect. Why wouldn't social media that's grown up in Russia or the Ukraine be different from one that grew up in Texas or California? God help us. God save us from Californians. <laughs> I know, I love them dearly. Right. So, big question. Where is the developing, emerging brand going to get their help to do this? Think about it, and I will come back to it. Assuming I don't run out of time, I've got five minutes apparently. Right, so I'll have to speed up a bit. When things go wrong, I thought I would check. Uh, we deal with Nike, Autodesk, Mazda, Hilton, blah de blah Disney, these sorts of brands, as well as brands you've never heard of, like Syngenta, Herman Miller, V-Live, Kong, blah, 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 blah. So I asked everybody back at the ranch, what are the problems they have with Russian and Ukrainian translators? Now, we don't really do much Ukrainian, so it's really Russian translators. What do you think the answer was? What is wrong with Russian translators? What mistakes do they make? <laughs> they just translate. Anything else? You know what they do wrong? The same thing everyone else does wrong. <laughs> they are no bloody different at all. <laughs> they forget to read the brief. They don't read. They then read the brief and they don't follow the brief. They ignore the glossary. Uh, they read the glossary and then they ignore the glossary. Ça change plus ça change. It's all the same. You know what can I say? <laughs> the the only the only area that we have had problems, and it's very specific, is in keyword research, SEO, translation, blah de blah We have trained translators. They've told us they're search literate. We've um, written them detailed briefs, but they generally speak, we have a problem with translators getting their head around search generally. And I know, uh, I think it's Maria Dorda, who's in one of the other rooms, is talking about this right now. You might want to check that out. I know that's not what you might call translation, Problem is, it is for us. The client now wants, when we translate something, we're doing the keyword research just before we do the translation. We're optimizing the translation as we go with primary and secondary keywords. It's part of the process. So you take your pick, get on board or not. Very quickly, um, another question. What do Russia and Japanese clients have in common? I'm not getting many answers today. You must be all asleep or something, you know. <laughs> Very good. That's a nice left field. Uh, I, I shall just read you a quote, okay? I don't want you to draw too much into this, but I did ask the question. If I, if I read you this quote, and you can tell me uh, if it sounds familiar. They seem to be very insular and often insist on doing their own thing, even if it's against corporate brand guidelines. They thrive on being different from everyone else and claim that no one outside their country understands their culture. Now, I make no comment, but uh, if you take out their country and put in Russia or China, it works. <laughs> now, that's, that's our experience of working with the, the brand's representative in these countries. So, you can do with that what you may. So, very, very quickly, what are we looking for? Well, in answer to my previous question, who is going to help these brands deliver? Well, you, me, us. That's our job. Forget the, the translation label. That's merd, crap, rubbish. 
We're, it, we're, we're in the localization business. Take it. That, that's what we do, right? So it's, it doesn't matter how we do it. And we have to adapt to what the client wants or else we're dead. Any company, if they don't adapt to the market conditions, I mean, how many steam engines are being sold these days? How many, how many steam engineers are there employed? Not a lot, just a few crazy enthusiasts, God love them. So we're looking, we're looking for people in, in, in really in three areas. We're not looking for the cheapest. We're not looking for the best translators in the most languages and the most subjects. We want subject matter expertise. Know your subject. You know, if you're doing a Nike translation, how do Nike compare in Kiev to Puma, Reebok, Converse, da di da di da? You need to understand that. You need to be reading the blogs, right? Or else you don't know the subject. You're just a translator who thinks they know the subject. We're looking for copy specialists. People can write in the style of the medium. Writing for social media, writing for blogs is not the same as translating a document. You know this. So don't do it. But tell people you can do it. Write your own blogs. If you're a specialist in leisure wear, in hotels or travel, blog about it and then send us the link, right? Oh, and if we follow it, we're following the same things. So we'll pick up that you're doing it, right? And all of a sudden you get some positioning. And then finally, we need media experts. What does that mean? That doesn't mean you're all television presenters or directors. That means you understand the media, right? So you understand blogging, online advertising. What is social media mon monitoring and mediation, right? You, you maybe need to do some of that on various social media websites. I think that's telling me I've better get off. Um, final, final point is we are not, it's really hard when someone's playing a piano in the background. It's really, it, we are not finding these link, what we need, the resources we need. And we're not finding them. Thank you. Where we're looking at the moment, right? So when we're going out to the places we talked about in this room yesterday, we don't find what we need. Why? You're all clever people. I'm sure you'll come up to me, oh, I can do that. Great. But, but we're, we're not looking. So you need to be in different places too. Right. So I'm going to finish. Because the piano player has made it bloody obvious I need to finish. So all, all, I, all I really want to say is, it's, I guess it, com it comes down to those words, is really, it, it's expertise and focus, right? And then be really, 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 really bloody good at something, and then tell everyone about it. That's the key to marketing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gordon. I guess a couple well, of minutes time. for questions, if any. <laughs> Do we have any questions? You're all stunned. They're sleeping. <laughs> uh, I have one question, actually. Uh, getting back to transcreation, this uh, pretty new, pretty new word in in the industry for me. Uh, what do you think about using CAD tools for translating marketing texts? probably transcreating them uh, in the meaning of limits, you know, limits, segmentations, uh, sticking to glossaries, and so on and so on. So do you think, what would be the trend of using CAD tools concerning marketing translations? Well, I guess as a, as a rule of thumb, in pure, tra pure transcreation, I would never use CAD tools at the beginning, right? I mean, forget it. I mean, transcreation is that. I mean, it's not, you say it's new. I first heard of it in 1995, before probably some people were born in this room. Um, so it's not a new word, but the, the key word is, is creation. It's creativity. They don't want a literal, they don't even want it, they don't just want idiomatic. They want something different. I mean, what, what excites the Ukrainian audience in Kiev? That's what they want. What, it, what is the vernacular? What, you know, if it's, if it's a game, what would the kids say on the street, on the skateboard, or, you know, whatever the equivalent is? So, and they don't want, the main thing about transcreation, which, which I was discussing with Katia here, who's talking about this later, is that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. When you transcreate, you offer three or four alternatives. 
And you might ask yourself, well, why do you do that? I mean, A, you should, you pay, you should be paid for it, right? There's no argument about this. You, it's a time-based thing. You should be paid for it. But what, the, what you need to do is anticipate the client. If you, give them, if you give somebody one answer, they'll argue with you. You give somebody three answers, and they're stuck, because the decision is now theirs, which one they pick. And if they pick one and it doesn't work, well, yeah, whose problem is that then, eh? <laughs> so you, you, you put the decision-making um, power in the person it should be with, you know? Or, or you can, we're advisors. It's, not, it's an art form, especially transcreation. And it needs, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Definitely not everyone's cup of tea. Only certain, we know this, a, a small proportion of translators are good at doing it. Thank you. More questions? <laughs> when, when does he leave? <laughs> okay, thanks Gordon once again. My pleasure. <laughs>